Dr. Rob, I have another one for you today. How do you feel about thermal necrosis? I feel about as passionately about thermal necrosis as I do pressure necrosis. Oh, my. In terms of it really doesn't exist. You would really have to go out of your way as a clinician to have thermal necrosis. You'd have to really kind of almost purposely do something wrong in order to get thermal necrosis. And so the, the, the first thing you need to know is that uh, thermal necrosis occurs at 47 degrees centigrade for a over a minute. You have to be at that temperature for over a minute. And so with our modern guided systems, we've done a, a research paper with some unpublished data right now <clears throat> that we're getting ready to release where we're showing our average drill time is 1.2 seconds. And, and that is including going in and coming out. So actually going in would be roughly half of that. So less than a second going in and then coming out. And so uh, the, drill, the drill times are way too fast for us to be concerned about heating up the bone. Yeah, that's extremely fast. Yeah, yeah. You'd be more inclined to see a thermal problem, and this is where the irony of it, of it is, is with freehand. Makes sense. Think about it. People are trying to carefully. Yes, if you've, if you've ever freehanded a dental implant, once you get your quote purchase point, you don't give it up because it's so hard to hold it. Initially, your, your tip of your drill is wandering off the dense bone. It wants to go to the left, the right, and you're like, I need to stay on target. And you find, if you get on target, there's this eu euphoria moment. You're like, I'm on target, stay on target, right? Star Wars, Star Wars fans out there. So stay on target, right? So. Once you get on target, you stay on target and you're going to go all the way to depth. You might be on that, you might be on that site 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. It's no wonder that the people that initially um, came up with the concepts of thermal necrosis were worried about heating up the bone because they were on the bone forever. They were on the bone forever. When you go guided, initially, people thought you're gonna you're gonna heat up the bone because you can't get water down into the you can't get water down into the hole, right? which you couldn't anyways, because the water wasn't going down the drill. Even if you were shooting straight at the level of the bone, water still doesn't go down the, the hole. It's tight, it doesn't yeah. fit, right? There's no room, but nevertheless. But, but they, were, they, were saying, they were thinking in their minds that when you go guided, you're gonna have the same drill times. But that's where when we did the analysis and came up with 1.2 seconds, 1.2 seconds for an average drill time, an average, the median was lower than the average. And what that says is that what happens is with the 2-0 drill, your starter drill, usually you have to go in and out like once or twice. You don't, you don't go all the way to death. You go, you call it the bone dance. You go in and out, in and out, and then you go down. So those, typically the first drill is a little bit longer. Okay, so it might be like three or four seconds, right? Long time, right? Oh yeah. So you're three or four seconds, but then the follow-up drills are just widening the hole a little bit and they go really fast. So the, your, your median is even less than the 1.2. So you're really, really fast. And then you say to yourself, okay, well, what about that four second drill time? Well, I'm here to tell you, the minute you're done with the 2.0 drill, you pick up a 2.5 drill. And the 2.5 drill makes the hole wider by removing the bone that you potentially just heated it. If you, if you could think that you heated it up with the four <laughs> seconds, you just removed it with the next drill a second later in one second. And so you're not gonna heat that bone up. The other thing about thermonecrosis is that Bone is an amazing insulator. Bone, bone on there's a, a coefficient of thermal conductivity. Bone falls on the chart really close to styrofoam, really close to styrofoam. And the reason is, is bone has a high water content. It has a lot of water in it. And so you think about if you had a pot with water in it, how long does it take to heat up the water? A long time, right? So. Bone is the same way. It takes a long time to heat up bone. You have to be like pretty, pretty, be pretty diligent about trying to heat it up. If your drill times are 1.2 seconds, you will not heat up the bone. Thermonecrosis does not exist unless you're doing something wrong. And what I mean by wrong is like you're freehanding it and you're on the bone for a long time. But if you're guided and you're doing it right, going in and out, you don't have to worry about Am I getting knocked out of position? The guide is holding you in position. You're not going to have thermonecrosis. It just won't happen. And then the other thing about thermonecrosis, which is you know, similar to the concept of pressure necrosis, is this. What does it look like? So just, I just ask myself these questions. I say to myself, so if I had thermal necrosis and my implant failed because of a thermal insult, 
what would that failure look like and how does it differ from other failures? And then there's just this long pause where people are like, hmm, I don't know. Does it feel the next, does, does this patient call back as soon as they're not numb and say, I'm just dying? Like, do they have like immediate pain or, or is there no pain or does it, does it take days or weeks or months before the failure? What does the failure look like radiographically? What does it look like clinically? How does it present? Like, there's just no evidence to what that, there's nobody's taken the time to try to sort that out to figure out what it might look like. So that's why an, another red herring, when I see people present from the podium and they go, and then this one failed, and I think it failed because of thermonecrosis, I, I just have to say, y you're likely not thinking hard enough because there's a lot of variables that go into it, uh, to a failure. As we've spoken about, a lot of failures, a lot of variables that go into a failure. We all know that. But, but thermonecrosis is gonna be so far down in my list so far down. Can you burn bone? You sure can. Can you get brown bone? If you do wisdom teeth, can you do brown bone? Absolutely, you can get brown bone. Okay. So you can burn bone, right? But because of the coefficient of thermal conductivity, that bone would be located to just a few microns. It's not going to travel millimeters into the bone. So if, if you had brown bone from a burr that was spinning too fast without enough irrigation, you can kill it. Absolutely. It's true, right? But it doesn't travel anywhere. It's on the surface, it's, it's microscopic, it's, it's microns, it's not millimeters, because so, the, the coefficient of, it, of thermal conductivity would prevent it from carrying through into the deeper areas, it stays on the surface. It's like if you have, you have a cold drink inside your Yeti, and the outside doesn't feel any different than room temperature, right? But the inside's really, really cold, because the wall of the, in, the, the, of the Yeti is insulated. So bone is an insulator, it's a really good insulator, so it's not going to heat up and travel that 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 temperature gradient. It's not going to travel through that bone. So thermal necrosis is another red herring, uh, and it's one that's that's really well used in the industry when we don't know why it failed, and we just throw it out there. Maybe we just overheated the bone. But if you're doing things right, using a guided protocol, I believe is less likely to have any potential risk than than freehand because you're only on the bone for a second or two. When I do my guided, my water pump has a delay that kicks on after I pull the, the handpiece out of the mouth. So when I step on the rheostat and I go in and out, the water goes doo, 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 and it shoots across the room as I'm pulling the drill out. It's not even on before I go in the mouth because it's that quick. So I am not concerned about uh, thermonecrosis in my practice with uh, guided systems. One thing I'll, I'll add is that if we look to our, our, our colleagues in orthopedics, you know, their drill lengths, their reamers and drill lengths are measured in centimeters and they're, they're, they're 20 centimeters long, extremely long drills. And they're about 6.5 millimeters in diameter. And they go down long bones, like, like the humerus the, or the femur, they go down long bones, the tibia, they go down long, long bones boring out the inside of the bone with no irrigation. They don't use irrigation and they don't worry about it. They don't even talk about it. Why, why did it become a subject in dentistry? I think it became a subject. It was something that was taught by Brandemar early on. So historically, you have the f kind of the father of dental implants telling the early surgeons that were interested in this and he, he, he didn't know everything early on, right? And so if you don't know everything, what you do is you, you err on the side of caution. You don't err on the side of, of recklessness. So to err on the side of caution would be to say, I want to make sure that we don't overheat the bone. Because we do know that if you overheat bone, that you can damage it, right? That That's known, right? So we're not saying that that can't happen. What we're saying, what I'm saying, my proposal here is that with a guided system properly implemented, the likelihood of that happening is darn near, darn near impossible. Like, I have never had it in my practice. I will tell you that because my drill times are too fast. If the drill comes out of the hole and the drill is cold to the touch, which it is always because I immediately take the 2.0 drill out and put the 2.5 in, it's never hot. So if the drill, which is metal, has it heated up, metal is a conductor, a good a good conductor, which means it heats up quickly. 
versus bone, which is an insulator, which is inside inside the mouth is the bone is an insulator and the metal is a conductor. If the metal's not hot, to be darn certain, that bone's not hot. It's mathematically impossible for the bone to be hot and the metal not to be, because they're they're rubbing against each other. So the friction that we're worried about is coming from bone rubbing on metal, right? That would be the friction yeah. we we're worried about. But the drills are never hot. So ask yourself this: You're a clinician. If you've ever exchanged the drill and burnt your tips of your finger you're doing something wrong, okay? Then you've got a problem. You're in the hole too long. I say, don't linger in the hole. Well, there's nothing down there but danger. Once you get your drill to depth, you get out. So don't, don't hang down there and just keep spinning and spinning and spinning. That's dangerous. So I tell people, get in, get out. And if you do it right, there is no concern for thermal. We got much bigger problems in dental implants to worry about than, than thermal necrosis. There are so many bigger fish to fry than thermal necrosis. We should focus our efforts on the ones that are really going to make a bigger difference in our practice and provide lower risk and better outcomes for our patients. That's where we, that's where we should spend our efforts. Focus on the important stuff, not on the stuff that's an, an easy scapegoat once again. Exactly. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.